Straight ahead on CCX News, local lawmakers dive into their legislative priorities. At the top of the list, Highway 610. Plus, a new city official in Plymouth. We find out her big plans for the city. But first. And while this debate isn't on our agenda for today, I challenge all of us to have this conversation openly and honestly. The chair of the Osseo School Board attempts to get people talking about school security. CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us. We begin with a challenge from the chair of the Osseo School Board. He wants the district and the community to have an open and honest discussion about security for students. School Board Chair Robert Gerhardt feels a certain number of approved staff members who are already gun permit holders could play a role in school security. And I for one am sick and tired of all the talk that happens after each one of these events and the same lack of tangible action that follows. Gerhardt gave a six-minute statement Tuesday night at Osseo's school board meeting following a presentation on school security and emergency preparedness. The presentation had already been on the agenda and was not, it was not in response to the mass school shooting in Florida. But Gerhardt took it upon himself to speak, saying he's been formulating his own solution over the last three years to all the school violence. But state and federal laws already in place also provide a relatively simple but almost completely unused way for school administrators to pick and choose which registered permit holders, a subset of the people who are already screened with all these other steps, who can be allowed to simply extend the protection they choose for themselves to the students around them. The method is simple, but goes unused for fear of political or public relations blowback. In the statement, Gerhard also talked about the idea of having more police in schools, but said money isn't readily available for that. No action was taken after Gerhardt's statement, and no other board member gave a response at the meeting. Meantime, Osseo School Superintendent Kate McGuire says no changes are being considered at this time to the district's stance regarding guns on school premises. McGuire said Chair Gerhardt's statements do not reflect the school district's stance or the superintendent's perspective. Quote, Chair Gerhardt clearly stated that he had not spoken in advance with anyone about his statements and that his comments represented only his personal perspective. You can read the superintendent's full statement and Chair Gerhardt's full statement on our website, ccxmedia.org. And now to the state capitol, where one major item on every lawmaker's to-do list is to tackle transportation and infrastructure. Local legislators have hopes a few local projects can get funding this session. When Highway 610 opened in late 2016, excitement was short-lived as the lack of an interchange with I-94 started causing a headache for drivers. Yeah, I don't need to explain that to the people back home. Representative Dennis Smith understands that frustration and hopes funding comes through this legislative session to finish the project. Tuesday night, the Maple Grove City Council passed a resolution supporting the connection and possibly more lanes on I-94 to improve traffic flow. We need a complete 610, uh, 44 years in the making. Um, it's partially connected to uh, 610 to 94, but it's creating massive traffic delays with the new connection. North Hennepin Community College also hopes to receive money through the bonding bill. They need new windows, new boilers, and more. Improvements that come with a price tag of more than $2 million. The request was, I think, in the neighborhood of about $100 million for just the Minsku system. But that's roof repair, sidewalk repair, tuck pointing, HVAC, you know, just any of those kinds of things that you have to do to maintain our college and university uh, buildings. Representative Smith also mentioned among his priorities for bonding bill funding includes money to expand a city-owned gun range that is used for police training. The number two official at Plymouth City Hall has only been on the job for about two months, but she already has some big plans in store for the city. In 2018, we have a number of software projects coming up, and a lot of them have to do with making citizen engagement easier and more effective. Uh, it's great when people want to come to a meeting and engage with the city that way, but that's not always possible. Finding an easy way to get feedback from people on how best to remodel the Plymouth Creek Center is one of the goals for Plymouth's new Administrative Services Director, Lori Hokanen. And if you're one of the people who rely on Plymouth Metrolink for your ride downtown, she says you can expect to see new coach-style buses for riders later this year. 
that most of Plymouth Metrolink riders are riders by choice, so they have other options, they have a car, um, and so you want to make that ride as attractive as possible. The new buses will arrive in the late summer. Hokanen says fares won't increase and costs will be offset by increased ridership. A local nonprofit that provides meals to families all around the world is looking for a few good volunteers. The organization Feed My Starving Children has taken over the Egan Company warehouse in Champlin. Volunteers will be packing meals here through Sunday. Each meal contains vitamins, vegetables, soy, and rice. The food will then be shipped off to help feed people in need all around the world. You can hear the music in the background. We have it loud, it's fun, it's upbeat music. You get to yell, you get to have fun. And a group from CCX Media also came out today to help. You've never seen a group look better in hairnets. <laughs> the goal is to help pack about 2 million meals by the time the event wraps up Sunday evening. Interested volunteers can sign up on the Feed My Starving Children website. Good job, guys. <laughs> Still ahead on CCX News, we hear from another local lawmaker about what's ahead this legislative session. Plus, rivals Maple Grove and Osseo battle in a key game in Northwest Suburban Conference boys basketball. But first, a chance of snow developing on Thursday afternoon. Welcome back. As the legislature gets down to business this week, a state senator from Plymouth says addressing the state's workforce shortage is a top priority this session. In an interview with Mike Johnson, Senator Paul Anderson also said lawmakers will spend time deciding whether to conform the state tax law to changes in the federal tax law. After the uh, federal tax bill was passed, now we have a situation where we want to make sure that uh, Minnesotans aren't uh, affected in some way with regards to a tax increase from the state uh, taxes. And this is a complex, this is a historic opportunity for us to dive into to potentially change the tax code in Minnesota, make it more business friendly. But again, it's making sure that the taxpayers uh, in an unintended way do not uh, receive a tax increase. Okay, we'll see what happens there. Yeah. The bonding bill is going to be big yeah. this time. Yeah. Uh, just how big the bill is going to be, I guess, is up for debate. But one item you'd like to see is the Rockford Road uh, uh, replacement in uh, in Plymouth. That's right. As we uh, have the conversation, this is generally a bonding year. Uh, this is not a funding year. We did that last year. So in this case, I really hope if, if we have a bonding bill that this is a big component of this. We uh, will, I think, see a focus from the Senate and the House on uh, road roads and bridges and trunk highways, those kind of things. And in this case, uh, the Rockford Road Bridge was built in the, uh, I believe if I'm not mistaken, the 50s to handle about 15,000 cars a, a day and it now handles about 60,000. And anyone that drives Rockford Road Bridge knows the, the, uh, the, the cautionary tale that you have to weave around turning traffic onto northbound and southbound 494. So we'd really like to see this done. Wished it would have been done when they did the big uh, reconstruction of 494 a few years ago, but we're going to fight for it this year. Sexual exploitation is yeah. a difficult subject, but one brought yeah. to the front by, uh, by a group of high school students. Yeah, there's uh, a group of students from Hopkins High School, Girls United Minnesota, led by kind of, I, I call her a super young Wonder Woman, uh, Jessica Melnick. Uh, this is a group that started probably back in 7th, 8th grade, back in Hopkins Middle School, and they started a group to take on tough uh, topics, and one of them, they realized that uh, Seeing on TV, they had a student at Hopkins High School that had been trafficked. And, and so they wanted to take on this conversation and realize that there are not enough resources in school and they didn't know enough about it. So they have brought it to us. This would be amending uh, what we passed last year. We led on with Emily's, or I'm sorry, Aaron's Law mm -hmm. with regards to educating students on, on sexual abuse. But this is bringing in sexual exploitation to the classroom. It's, a, it's not a mandate. This is a shell for the school districts, but the Department of Education is behind it and it's a wide bipartisan group uh, supporting the bill. Coming up, high school might be enough for some to handle, but not for this week's standout student. We will meet her a little later. But first, the Brett girls hockey team skates for a win in the opening round of the state class A tournament. John Jacobson has their highlights up next.
I'm John Jacobson with sports. Rex girls hockey team's overtime win over Orono last week gave the Mustangs their first state tournament appearance since 2012. Mustangs are the number two seed in the Class A tournament. And this morning they opened in St. Paul facing unseeded Marshall in the quarterfinals. First period, Rex Olivia Mobley passes to Carly Beanick. Her shot stopped, but she gets to the puck and scores on the rebound, and it's one to nothing. Breck on the power play goal. The Mustangs would add another to go up two nothing. Second period, Mobley skates out of the corner and cuts to the net. She'll score on a backhander here. Another power play goal for Breck, and they're up three to nothing. And then the goals start to come fast and furious. Ella Brophy's shot is rebounded in by number 10 Lucy McGlynn. First of two goals in the game for McGlynn. Just over a minute later, Sadie Lindsay skates into the right circle and she'll beat the goalie on the far post here. And that goal makes it five to nothing Mustangs. 25 seconds later, they'll score again. Gabby Billing chips a pass out to Emily Zumwinkle and her shot is in. Breck wins nine to two. They'll face Proctor Hermantown in the semifinals Friday morning at the XL Energy Center. The section playoffs started Tuesday night for a couple of local boys hockey teams. Armstrong Cooper hosting Hopkins in a section 6 AA play-in game. Despite being outshot early, Hopkins strikes first. Mario Hadley's shot from the point gets through for a goal. Royals lead 1-0 after one. Tied 1-1 in the second. It's Jonah Jangula to Drew Eide back to Jangula for the shot and goal. And Armstrong Cooper takes a 2-1 lead through two. In the third period, Henry Sweeney delivers a nice pass onto the stick of Wyatt Nelson. He snaps a wrist shot home and it's tied up at two. But a couple of minutes later, Ide emerges from the scrum in the corner and tucks a shot away for the game winning goal. Armstrong wins it three to two. The reward quarterfinal meeting with top seed at Edina on Thursday. In boys basketball, Osseo came into Tuesday night tied with Park Center for first place in the Northwest Suburban Conference's West Division. Maple Grove's quietly had a strong season and they had hoped to knock off their rival from Osseo. The Orioles playing without injured star guard Zach Tyson. Maple Grove takes control early. Jared Rainey drives and scores plus a foul as the Crimson take an eight to nothing lead. Jordan Stenslin is the trailer here and nails a three. It's part of a great first half for Stenslin and it's 13 to three. Osseo gets it going. They get a steal at midcourt and Cornell Richardson drives for the layup to pull the Orioles within seven. Stenslin pops a three from the corner. He scores 13 in the first half. Maple Grove leads by eight at halftime. Second half, Osseo heats up. Anthony Williams hits uh, three quick inside hoops after being limited by foul trouble early in the game. Emmett Page will score here for Maple Girl, for Osseo rather. The Orioles take the lead. Page with 21 points on the night. Maple Grove recovers though. Alex Battis there scoring one of his four second half baskets. Corner three here for Stenslin. Maple Grove gets a season split with Osseo 61-54 the final. Maple Grove looking for a rare sweep of the Orioles in girls basketball. Maple Grove jumps out to an early lead. Autumn Malinar connects on a three-pointer. Crimson lead nine to nothing. Malinar scores 16 points in the game. Maple Grove can be tough defensively inside. Katrina Tice perfectly timed block here to turn away the Orioles. Abby Schulte gets free behind the defense, takes the pass from Malinar and lays in two of her 10 points. Maple Grove leads by 14. Taya Hampton scores four points off the bench for Osseo, including two here on the nice and loud pass from Jasmine Haynes. Maple Grove leads at 32-11 at halftime. Second half, Maple Grove on the break. Schulte, the Tice for the basket and foul. 14 points in the game for the Crimson Senior. Maple Grove earns their 20th win of the season. Jordan Lamker with a three here. Crimson wins 61-23. They finish the regular season Friday at Elk River. The Providence Academy girls basketball team has played well in the last month. The Lions look for another win Tuesday. Senior night as the Lions hosted Delano. Providence has a good post player in Anna Counts and they go inside the Counts here for two points. Maggie Murphy will miss a baseline shot but Counts will grab the offensive rebound and score for a 10 to 6 Providence lead. Tootie Lewis gets a steal at half court and sends it to Haley Hodeker for the layout plus a foul. 
Providence leads 33-29 at halftime. Second half, Murphy with a good move to score inside. It's Providence goes up 45-29. Dola makes it interesting later, but the Lions win at 66-52, and they are now 15-10. And, and that is it for sports. Shannon and Alex, back to you. All right, thank you, John. Up next, a standout student who already has a jump start on college. You meet a student from the Brooklyn Center Early College Academy School when we come back. This week's standout student attends a school you might not have heard about. It allows kids a chance to succeed in smaller classrooms. Stephanie Otero is from the Early College Academy School, an alternative high school in Brooklyn Center. Eric Nelson has more. Stephanie hit the ground running. Started doing A's and B's right away when she came here. Stephanie Otero is in high school, but you're just as likely to find her in college. The sophomore switched from Brooklyn Center High to the Early College Academy, where teachers say she has blossomed. A larger high school wasn't a good fit for her. Stephanie believes ECA is the perfect spot for her. She likes the school's intimate setting and hands-on approach. They give you more attention, they help you more, they give you more opportunities. But ECA isn't her only school. She's also in a program that lets her earn credit at Minneapolis Community and Technical College. Stephanie is a phenomenal student. On top of that, Stephanie squeezes in time to play soccer and other extracurricular activities. She's become extremely independent and reliable, which is really saying a lot for a, a 10th grader, right. what everything that she's doing and that she's taken on. Her teachers say taking classes at MCTC has boosted her confidence. I definitely see Stephanie as having the skills to thrive in the real world. Every report I get about her at the college class says she's doing magnificent. I'm actually taking a reading 180. It's it's like a reading normal class, just that they give me like they give me a heads up on what I have to do for my future. The soft-spoken student is well liked by her teachers. Josiah Moore taught Stephanie until she started taking college courses. It's really sad for me that Stephanie is not in my class anymore. She's not one to brag about herself or be super boisterous about what she's doing, but she's just quietly confident and a fabulous leader. In Brooklyn Center, I'm Eric Nelson, CCX News. Early College Academy has an enrollment of 75 students and nine of them take at least one college course. That's all the news for us. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here again tomorrow starting at four.